Okay, uh, welcome AP World History students to uh, chapter 28, uh, the Islamic Empires. Uh, this is the last chapter in this unit. I feel like this is one of the more difficult chapters uh, for students as well. There's quite a few names in it, and they're, they're unfamiliar Muslim names, so it, it's kind of hard to keep everybody straight. But really, before we begin, uh, you need to write down a few commonalities between these three empires that we'll be discussing, which are the Ottoman, the Safavids, and the Mughal dynasties. Um, they are all Islamic empires. They're all ruled autocratically, uh, essentially meaning that you've got one person in charge who hoards all the power. Um, and as I said, they're all Muslim empires, but uh, most of them do have large, uh, except for the Mughals, uh, they have large minorities of Christians inside their uh, dynasties uh, inside their empire. So they have to have some sort of religious tolerance. Otherwise, it would be chaos all the time. Uh, whereas the Mughals are in India, aren't many Christians there, but you will have issues with Hindus there. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, all three of these dynasties are very much concentrated inward, sort of isolationist, uh, like the Ming and Qing dynasties will become and Japan will become as well later on. Uh, agriculture was the main part of their industry, so you should, all three of them, so you should know that. And strangely enough, several of them, even though they're situated on good trade lines, really didn't actively seek long-distance trade. They're not really they're not really sending merchants out into the world to establish links and ties that way, uh, probably because they're very culturally conservative. Uh, they're very afraid that new ideas will upset uh, the stability in their empires. I think as such, uh, you'll see that they certainly begin to, to be left behind by uh, European nations and, and such who are actively seeking new technology and new ideas. All right. Okay, so here's your map, 1500 to 1800. We've got our three empires here. The Ottoman Empire should look, if, if you're paying attention and you remember what you've learned up to this point, it looks like you know, the old Byzantine Empire, the, the, the other half of the Roman Empire, um, with a couple of additions there, of course. Uh, they conquer all, all the way down into Egypt. Um, but, you know, the old Greek and Roman center, well, not Roman, but the old Greek centers are going to be under Ottoman control. The Safavids are really modern-day Iran and Iraq, uh, so the old Persians uh, are their base, really. And then you can see the Mughals to the far east, and they are uh, northwest and central India. Um, you know, so there we go. All right, let's start with the Ottoman Empire. You see their dates, 1289 to 1923. In 1289, they are not big, big at all. Um, the Ottomans will, will really make their appearance on the stage once they conquer um, uh, Constantinople in 1453. But okay, so you get a man named Osman who leads these band of you know semi-nomadic Turks uh, to become Gaz Ghazi. You need to know that term. That's Muslim religious warriors, the Ghazi. Um, they capture Anatolia. Remember that Anatolia is this area right here. Uh, it's modern-day Turkey. It's where Istanbul, you see Istanbul there. That's Constantinople. This is the breadbasket. There's a lot of good agriculture in Anatolia. That's where the Greeks colonized often uh, to feed themselves. Um, in the Balkans, they forced Christian families to surrender young boys to military service. Uh, these young boys would essentially be brainwashed, uh, and many of them would grow up to be very loyal uh, Janissaries. They would become Muslims. They were formerly Christians, but they would become Muslim warriors, uh, many of them, you know, almost zealous in their service. Uh, so make sure you know what Janissaries were, kind of unique to these guys. All right, Mehmed II, or Mehmed the Conqueror, uh, he captures Constantinople in 1453. He renames it Istanbul. Uh, the Hagia Sophia will be uh, taken over and become a Muslim mosque. Um, he transformed from a warrior sultan to an emperor of two lands, both Europe and Asia, because uh, they're on that. Uh, Constantinople is right there on the on the edge of the two continents. Um, planned to capture the Pope, uh, but he was unsuccessful in this endeavor. Uh, 
However, he is going to get the Ottoman Empire up and really rolling. Uh, not long after him, you get Suleiman the Magnificent, who's going to expand Ottoman rule into Asia and into Europe. I would even besiege Vienna, which is in Italy, in 1529. Um, and he developed the Ottomans as a naval power, which is important because the, the other ones, the Safavids and the and the the Mughal dynasties really did not become any kind of naval power. Uh, just the Ottomans, and just for a short time, really, um, in a lot of their history, they don't have great naval powers either, and that will be a disadvantage for them. <coughs> um, with the Safavids, uh, Ismail, a young military leader, 1501-1524, uh, he was orphaned. His parents were killed by his enemies. And he would end up becoming the religious leader called Shah. And he changes the official religion of the realm to something that he calls Twelver Shiism. It's a weird type of Islam. Uh, and in some of the core beliefs were that there were 12 infallible, meaning that they couldn't make mistakes, imams uh, that came after Muhammad. But the 12th imam was in hiding and he was ready to take power. Uh, these Twelver Shiists wore distinctive red hats called Kizilbash, uh, which basically meant redheads. Um, and the empire was called the Safavid Empire after Safi al-Din, uh, who was a Sufi thinker. Remember, these are basically Persians and, and uh, or, you know, Iraq, modern-day Iraq, Iran people. All right. Now, the Ottomans actually attacked the Safavids. They don't view them, they're, they're worshiping a different, the Shia, they're following more of a Shia sect of Islam, and so the two don't get along very well here. Uh, again, kind of like modern-day Iraq and Iran don't get along because they are different types of Muslims. Um, heavy use of Ottoman and gunpowder technology gives them the upper hand. All three of these will become known as the gunpowder empires. Uh, the Ottomans get it first, though, and it gives them the advantage in the battles. Uh, however, Safavid leader Ismail escaped, um, and this led to two centuries of ongoing conflict, conflict between um, these two empires. Shah Abbas the Great uh, revitalized the weakened Safavid Empire. Uh, he did this through administrational reforms. Uh, he's reforming the military and making it more efficient. Um, and he finally begins to expand some trade, and they get some military expansion that would uh, help the empire out. All right, moving on to the Mughal Empire again. Uh, Mughal, this is basically Persian word for Mongol um, and always associated with India. Zahir al-Din Muhammad, or Baber the Tiger as he was known, was a Shagatai Turk. So he's from Central Asia there to the north. Uh, invaded northern India for plunder in 1523, decided he'd stay. Uh, gunpowder technology gave him an advantage, and he ends up founding the Mughal Dynasty which would expand throughout most of the Indian subcontinent, as you saw on the map. Uh, now, his grandson was Akbar, who would become Akbar the Great, uh, who won fear and respect after throwing Adham Khan, leader of the army, out the window twice. Uh, the second time he did it, uh, just to make sure he was dead. Um, he created a centralized government. We know in throughout much of India's history, they sometimes they're just regionalized kingdoms, but he's going to centralize, the Mughals are, centralize their power. Uh, he destroyed the old Hindu kingdom of Vijayanagar, but he was, strangely enough, uh, religiously tolerant, and he's actually trying to unite all of India under religion. So he promotes something he calls divine faith, which was this syncretic blend of Islam and Hinduism. Remember that these two religions are butting heads tremendously in India. 25% of the people there are Muslim and 75% are Hindu. So he's trying to unify them under religion. And um, uh, so he promotes his divine faith. Has some success, but, um, you know, obviously India is still going to have their religious issues. Uh, Aurangzeb uh, expanded Mughal Empire into southern India. Uh, he, however, was not religiously tolerant. He was very hostile to Hinduism, and Hinduism is strongest in central and southern India. He demolished Hindu temples, uh, replaced them with Muslim mosques. And he placed a tax on Hindus to encourage them their conversion uh, to Islam. As you can imagine, that's going to cause a lot of issues. 
Now, there are common elements of all three of these gunpowder empires. Uh, the prestige of the dynasty was dependent on the piety and military prowess of, of the ruler. So basically, you have ebb and flows as far as how powerful these nations are or these empires are. Um, the they have relationships with the Turkish traditions, um, these basically nomadic warriors. Um, they, but all three of them issue unilateral decrees, uh, basically autocratic rule. What the what the ruler said. It's not far off from absolute monarchy in Europe. Um, there were intra. Family conflicts over power, meaning that families squabbled amongst themselves. Uh, an example of that in 1595, a sultan massacred his 19 brothers, some of which were infants, and 15 expectant women, uh, pregnant women, uh, and strangled them with silk. Uh, so you had these, um, these power squabbles within the families, and that was common to all three of the gunpowder empires. Uh, some other commonalities, really. Women officially banned from political activity. Um, they still had this, oh, we revere you as mothers and whatnot, but in reality, uh, they don't have much of a public voice at all. Um, Suleiman the Magnificent, however, did defer to his concubine, Khurum Sultana, whose name was originally Roxlana, a Ukrainian woman. Um, she was able to convince her husband to murder his eldest son in favor of her own child, um, so she was obviously a woman who had quite a bit of influence and power, uh, but she was certainly rare uh, in the time period. Uh, now, we talked about the influence of American crops on Japan and China, uh, but they have less – the Colombian exchange and those crops coming from the Americas have less dramatic change in the Muslim empires. Uh, two that do become important, however, are coffee and tobacco, and really in the beginning – they view coffee as, as something pretty bad, and um, they feared lax morality of coffee houses. I guess people were getting together at coffee houses and drinking coffee and being in too good of a mood. And, and when you're in too good of a mood, I guess, uh, you do bad things, I suppose. Uh, population growth was uh, a reflection of territorial additions and losses. Uh, you're not going to see like staggering population growth uh, from food like you will in, in kind of the Chinese areas. Uh, trade with the English East India Company and the French East India Company, also the Dutch VOC. Uh, so they do have some trade there with these outside sources. <coughs> However, it's still something they're not really actively seeking. Uh, here's some maps of population growth. Um as you can see, the Mughals, as as you would expect, India being much more populous than these other places, than the Middle East. Uh, the Mughal dynasty is always having a lot more uh, growth. Uh, essentially, by 1800, the Mughal dynasty or the Mughal Empire was, you know, almost 200 million. So 126 million smaller than America 200 years later. All right, religious diversity. Uh, there is religious diversity within these empires, and of course that can cause a lot of conflict. Uh, in the Ottoman Empire, you had large minorities of Christians and Jews. Um, you, know, you're, you have you know, Byzantine Orthodox Christian um, heritage in these areas. Jews have been there thousands of years earlier than either Christianity or um, Islam. In the Safavid Empire, you had Zoroastrians. Remember, those are Persians. Um, you know, Ahura Mazda and Earth is a Battleground and whatnot. Jews and Christians as well there. In the Mughal Empire, you had uh, large Hindu populations. You had the eccentric Jains, the Jainist peoples. You had Zoroastrians there as well. You did have some Christians, and you had some Sikhs as well, which was basically like a blend between Hindu and Muslims. So in India, a lot of uh, religious diversity. Uh, the Mughal, Akbar the Great, was the most tolerant. Uh, he received Jesuits. Remember, Jesuits would be Roman Catholics politely, but he resented Christian exclusivity, uh, essentially that they couldn't work with anything else. And he didn't want to be just Christian. He's wanting a blending of religions. Uh, he was enthusiastic about his syncretic Sikhism. Uh, self-serving divine faith and Sikhism is one of the largest religions in the world today although it is mostly just in India but India has a lot of people
All right. Status of religious minorities. How were they treated? Non-Muslim protect were protected people. Uh, the Jimmy. Uh, basically, they paid a special tax. And a lot of times that was your Christians and Jews, people of the book, as they thought of them. Uh, they would pay the special tax to the Josiah. Uh, they were allowed to worship freely and to own property and to settle legal affairs. So they did have these um, abilities, protections. In the Ottoman communities, the millet system of self-administration, uh, the Mughal rule, Muslims were supreme, uh, but they did work in tandem with the Hindus. Again, uh, they're the minority here in India, uh, that there's still going to be more Hindus. There's always more Hindus than there are Muslims there. Uh, but under Akbar, the Jizaya was abolished, uh, but it would be brought back under Aaron Gazab, who was not nearly as religiously tolerant. He is uh, all Muslim all the time. Uh, Akbar, remember him. Uh, divine faith, Sikhism, he wants a cultural blending. He wants a religious blending uh, there in the Mughal dynasty there in India. All right, capital cities, Istanbul was the cultural capital of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, remember, that's Constantinople. It's been a fantastic city its entire creation uh, for a very long time. Uh, it's no less so under the Muslims. Uh, rededication of the Hagia Sophia Church as the Hagia Sophia uh, Mosque. So remember I told you it gets turned into a mosque. Um, Isfahan becomes the major Persian city. Um and Akbar built the magnificent Fetifer Sikri. Uh, he chose a site without sufficient water supply, however, and it would end up getting abandoned. Uh, the Taj Mahal is one of the more famous, um, and, and you know you need to Google these and get pictures of them um, because the AP exam does ask architectural questions. And the Taj Mahal is a wonderful example of Mughal architecture. Uh, you know you had a you had a leader whose wife died, and he loved her so much, he, he built the Taj Mahal as basically a memorial to her. And it's, it's a very good example of Mughal architecture, so make sure uh, you look at it. Deterioration of imperial leadership. The Ottoman princess, you'll see this theme, uh, same thing that kind of happened to uh, the Ming Dynasty. They became lazy through luxury. Uh, you had uh, rulers such as Selim the Sot or Ibrahim the crazy. Uh, those names tell you all you need to know about them, not good leaders. Um, attempts to isolate them only compounded the problem. Um, you had religious tensions between conservatives and liberals. Um, the Middle East is is a quagmire today. Um, it is it is a place of, it has such a interesting religious history that there's always issues there's a lot of fighting that goes on over religion in the middle east uh role of women i mean in conservative places the role of women's got to stay what it had been for a long time which wasn't very much uh more liberal areas were trying to give women more rights and so there's um tension there uh, the wahhabi movement in arabia actually denounced the ottomans as unfit to rule um the Ottomans were being too liberal. Uh, they, they forced the destruction of observatories and printing presses. Uh, this idea that the Ottomans were too influenced by Western culture um, and that that was, you know, too much Christianity and stuff like that. And so kind of have this movement from within the Wahhabi. The Safavid Shiites persecuted Sunnis, non-Muslims, and even Sufis who were Muslim um, missionaries. So you have so much religious tension, uh, even amongst the uh, Muslims who are also broken up into uh, groups like the Christians were. All right, economic and military decline. Foreign trade was controlled by Europeans. Remember, the Europeans in this time period are very outward seeking. They are not focused in on themselves like much of Asia is and the Middle East. Uh, the military administrative network was expensive to maintain, uh, and eventually the Janissaries, who remember were those Christian brainwashed boys, uh, soldiers, uh, they eventually mutinied when they were paid with debased coinage, meaning that the coins uh, weren't worth as much as what it seemed they were. Uh, other revolts would follow that. 
and they had wars that they weren't weren't very productive in. They just they were behind. They couldn't fight the Russian or the uh, the Europeans because the Europeans were more technologically advanced. Um, and, and so the Ottomans don't produce their own. They're having to purchase it. And so they're kind of always playing catch up. The Europeans actively studying Islamic culture for purposes of trade and missionary activities. However, the Muslim empires were less interested in the outside world. And so, like I said, they fell behind technologically speaking. Um, you know, they're still not using the printing press and they're, they're preferring books handwritten. All of this, um, if you can see a theme in any of this time period, it's that Europe uh, was technologically advancing and, and right on the c and cutting edge of things. And Asia and the Middle East are becoming culturally very conservative and inward looking. And as such, they fall behind and it's going to mean that they become uh, victims of the Europeans through colonization later on. And looks like that is the last slide. So uh, remember gunpowder in, uh, empires here, that there are a lot of similarities between them, meaning that they are all majority Muslim, um, you know, typically culturally conservative, and that they are looking inward and not outward. Uh, but of course, they have enough differences that the Safavids and the Ottomans who border each other uh, will certainly have some conflicts. Uh, the Mughals, they certainly stand apart a little bit as being part of India, uh, with their high point leader being Akbar the Great, who is seeking religious uh, solidarity in the country. Okay, guys, uh, hopefully this helps you out, and I will see you in class.